Well, you've got one of the greatest jobs in the world. It's, it's quite uh, amazing. And I work with uh, passionate people, uh, yeah. great skills. Yeah. And uh, we go everywhere. We, we go, we do molds. That's a piece from Babylon. Uh, it's a Côte d'Amourabi. Wow. And it's in the Louvre. I don't know if you see. It has the yeah. first written law. Uh, yeah. Law is written on the surface. And that was the first time he had a, a law written uh, mm -hmm. somewhere. Sophie, where you're in, I love your background. What's happening over there? It's beautiful. Well, that's the workshop. I know. It's fantastic. <laughs> First of all, tell us what your title is. I'm the manager of the, of the site, basically, of the workshop. Those are two workshops. Two workshops that were created uh, at the Louvre when the castle of the Louvre was transformed into a museum. That happened 200 years ago during a revolution. Oh, wow. No okay, more kings. So, so what we do we do with the, you know, the castles that belong to the kings? They transformed it into a museum. Right. And they decided to have these uh, molding, cast and molding workshop inside. Back then, we used to be there. Instead of being in Saint-Denis, we were in, we used to be located uh, in the Louvre itself. And they decided to do that uh, casting workshop and also print workshop, which is the other part. And they decided to do that in order to complete the uh, museum. The museum had all the uh, king's belongings, um, these antique sculptures, uh, but there were not were enough of them to really, you know, have real museum with the read narrative. So they decided to complete them with casts, plaster casts. So you have an art history background. What makes you want to do this particular job? Well, these um, those workshops are part of a larger company that runs museum stores, uh, museum exhibitions. The company that uh, does services for museums in France, so the Louvre, but also Versailles or Orsay, you know, many museums. And that company runs these workshops. And I used to work for that company in publishing before working at this job. So I was just working in publishing, and uh, there was a job opening. And I applied along with other people that I applied. I was not the only one, but I think they picked me up because I had a knowledge of production. When you do publishing for exhibition catalogs, you really need, it's very really complex, uh, putting together a book with pictures mm -hmm. and mini text. Also I had this art history background. And I had also in the publishing department, I used to work a lot with the business side, on the business side. So I had this business background. So I had those three backgrounds that were useful. Now, what is this that I have in my hand? <laughs> so this is the foot of Alexander the Great. It's a, it's a part of a larger picture, a larger sculpture, sorry. Right. And uh, it was molded by our team a long time ago. And uh, we have you know, the mold in our uh, storage, which is on location. We have 6,000 molds of right. different sculptures. I was looking through the Louvre website and then it connected me to Sophie's part of the museum where they make casts right. of, the, of the actual, or they have the casts of the actual sculptures. So this is actually a piece of an actual, this, this is an exact replica of Probably. Alexander the Great foot. Of, uh, not of, 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 of a sculpture that they say is Alexander. We don't, we're right. not sure, right, Sophie? Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So to be able to create, you know, it's a, it's a very special thing that you're doing there. Is it good that every, like Jesse gets to, you know, send in and get, get this? What does that do to art and to um, sort of being proprietary and it democratizes it. It's like, I get to have a piece of that. How do you feel about that? Obviously you feel good about it if you're working mm -hmm. there, but right. how is that, what does that, what does that do for all of us? How does that change things? Well, that's, you know, that's the purpose of this company I'm working for, which is it's called RMN, Grand Palais, Réunion des Musées Grand Palais in Paris. So that company's job is to help museums diffuse art to the wider population that can be through objects, can be through souvenirs, you know, you know, some people might think souvenirs are all not very you know, high-end, but it can be through high-end objects, can be through pictures. We have a photo, 
photo agency. It can be through exhibitions. We do organize large exhibitions publications, all kind of venues that help to um, make sure that art is accessible to the, the, the greatest uh, amount of people. Because art is my passion, you know, when you have a passion, you like to share it. So that's a way for me to share my passion. On the bottom of this, there's a signature. Matt yeah. Mars, wait, 2021, or Max yeah. or Mass. Well, that's uh, the name of the person that did the patina. You have a stamp on it that is engraved and the stamp of the company to make sure it's a replica coming from our company. Right. But then you also have the signature of uh, the, the, the craftsman girl, Julie. Her name yes. is Julie, who did the handmade patina because otherwise it's just white plaster. Now, it's not that easy to do these things. It's not like you just pour the mold and out comes the thing, right? There's a lot of craftsmanship that goes into the actual construction of these. So is it, is that a computerized process or is that just, you pour the mold? Like what actually happens to make one? To make one, I'm gonna take, gonna take something you have next to me. You have, you know, that's, can you Amazing. see? They apply silicon. They, they're gonna make the seam in the middle of it and they're gonna apply silicone both ways with, you know, with a, a brush. And they're gonna also apply a plaster on top of that. It takes, a, you know, it seems easy when I say it, but it takes quite many, uh, it's many layers of silicone and uh, many layers of plaster. And then it's gonna dry and they're gonna unmold. They're gonna take off the plaster and then unmold the silicone. Now, on the piece like that, it's quite easy. It's small and it's the head has no, uh, just a simple shape. Now, when you have- um, Now, is that one from example, Notre, is that from Notre Dame? You're no, saying? that's no. from a cathedral in Reims, the city that is the capital of Champagne. You know Champagne, right? right? The region. Right. I love Champagne. <laughs> I like to drink Behind it me well. actually, there is, one guy coming from uh, Notre Dame, another angel. Same but you said period. that that angel, sorry, you said that angel came from something that was destroyed. Yeah. So was that the only Jumping. artifact yeah. left? Uh, the cathedral was destroyed during World War I by the Germans. And luckily we already had some mold of some of the angels mm. of the cathedral. That really was great to help yeah. to reconstruct and rebuild the cathedral. Now, if you go to Reims, you have Champagne and you have the cathedral they rebuilt with all the sculptures. Now, a lot of these sculptures, they were, we don't really know where they came from or what the context of what they were made, you know, why they were made like this Alexander foot, you know, that's okay. probably a, you know, a thousand years old. So we don't know, we don't know the, the context of it. So how do you decide which things you'll make molds of? What happened is that uh, curators decided of the Louvre decided to choose from masterpieces of the Greek of ancient culture. Greek and Roman sculpture. So the choice was, what do we want to put in the museum? Then during the 19th century, the other big choice was uh, sculptures that will be sending to um, art schools, fine art schools. Students that wanted to become uh, artists, painters, sculptures, even architects would practice. It was very important to practice in front of the best art ever you could see, because if you copied, you know, copied painting or drawing the best, art you could see on the planet, then you had the chance to become as good as those artists or even better than them. So that was the ambition. So they did send, they had the workshop, had to produce hundreds and hundreds of uh, reproductions. They chose those, you know, Greek, Roman and Greek sculptures. And you had copies of them in every fine art school of, of France, but also of Europe, in America, in China, everywhere. Like now we still sell a lot of those to schools. Like right now we're having a big production for a New York school and another huge production for a school in uh, China, in Yunnan. So that's what they will choose. They will choose what they thought. Will those yeah. teachers or faculty come to the Louvre and walk around the, the, the foot and say, well, hey, I want, you know, you know, because you can have thousands of them. So you have, you know, you have to choose. So do they, do they just choose like I did online or do they actually come there and look at the thing? Well, back then, you know, they, they were those famous antiques. Everybody knew, like every man that was, I say men because of course they were men, but they were 
you know, in fine arts business or in the ministers or uh, directors of schools and university teachers, they knew them. They used to go to Rome. Uh, they used to, so they knew exactly what they wanted. You know, they wanted the uh, um, the Apollo. They wanted the Athena. They wanted a famous uh, Hercules Farnese or um, Ares Borges or the disco ball. You know, the um, the, the guy was throwing a disc. I don't know the titles in English. Right. Right. <laughs> anyway, so right. that, they were very clear about it. Then they then they decided, you know, some directors from school will say, hey, I really love Michelangelo. I think that just after the Romans, you had his other sculpture that was great, it's Michelangelo. Can you provide a Michelangelo? So they would say, okay, and they will go because they will be paid for. They will ask in Italy a molders to send cast of Michelangelo um, Moses or the, the slaves in the Louvre or so boom they had uh, Michelangelo so as the taste evolved in the 19th century the demands were different when you put a mold on a Michelangelo I imagine it's a it doesn't hurt the stone right you know we're talking about the skills of the craftsmen people here the people that's mm -hmm. their skill their skill is you know a little piece like that is easy you're not going to damage it but a piece that our arms and legs or is doing a movement, then it becomes difficult and you have a risk of uh, damaging the surface, but also mm -hmm. when you demold breaking pieces, you know, the old pieces. So that's really what we are kind of famous for, what we try to maintain. We really take our time. We dialogue a lot with the restorators with curators. Uh, so that's really what the big attention it, it's very important for us. That's really what we are trusted for. Is taking a mold better than doing it, making a three-dimensional model with a computer? Well, right now a mold is still five microns. So five microns are the, uh, the size of the digital prints. And the best machines right now on the market for 3D are 10 microns. But those right. machines cannot do more than that size, you know? So if you want a three meter uh, uh, victory of Samutras, the Nike, which is three meters, then you're gonna have to, you have to print and you're gonna have all the seams everywhere. So it's impossible. Like I'm gonna show you how I took a picture for you. That's a mold in the making in the Louvre nowadays. Oh, like wow. this, I don't know if you see. So that's a yeah. huge, that's very complex to mold a piece like that, you know? How long does that take? That took three weeks yeah. and three, pers three person, three, three, three molders. And are they, a, are they a team with, you yeah. know, like an apprentice and a, and a, you know, the master molder and a, two apprentices, that kind of thing? Yeah, there is the, the chief, there is the, um, you know, the number two, uh, and then there is a bunch of other people that are different specialization, and then you have apprentices and you have interns. What constitutes a masterpiece? Because when you're deciding what we're going to copy, right, or, or duplicate, what, how do you go about it? What's the criteria and has it changed? 19th century, you had different people involved, you know, directors of museums, of schools. You had uh, people asking for something. They were some time of uh, you know, masters in the domain. They, had, they were art historians. Nowadays, uh, 20th century, uh, we had another input, which was we had stores. That's a new thing. It's 20th century, you know, stores in museums. And that was, you know, what can we sell that people are going to be able to put in a bag, you know, so it has to be small, that is in the museum, and that is going to be, you know, pretty in, inside of a house, or it's going to be a souvenir of a museum. And that's more a business view, right? It's but more what's then, desirable to the person. Exactly. So that's more marketing. Then you have uh, something we've been doing for the past maybe 30 years. It's you have the sculptures in the Garden of Versailles, many of them, more than 100. And they've been there for 300 years. And with pollution, they're deteriorated. And uh, so they've decided to, to protect them. So they're going to go inside of a part of the castle, but you cannot leave a garden such as the park of Versailles with the sculptures because really it was made by the king with the idea of having a lot of sculptures. So we are in charge of making replicas. So that's another use. That's how we also choose sometimes. We don't really choose, but um, curators, 
or museum uh, directors ask us to mold sculptures so they can protect them. Or the other side, the other way, they have sculptures in the museums and they want everybody to see them, but they're fragile because they're in plaster. So we mold those pieces that are in museums, we do replicas for outside purpose. So the citizen can see what is in the museum kind of sometimes hidden in storage. So that's how we end up with many sculptures from different reasons. When Notre Dame burned down, um, or most of it burned down, did that make the work that you do, did make give a deeper understanding about why the work that you do is so important? Very fortunate that many sculptures had been already taken down for restoration before it burned down. And the other sculptures, sculptures were not damaged. It was a roof, it was other parts, but not so, thanks God. But we do have, you know, many molds of many sculptures from Notre Dame. So yeah, that's when I saw it burning, that's what we did. We looked in our files to see what we had Notre Dame and make sure, you know, but thanks God, you know, that it was not necessary to, uh, to you know, go when to our collection. We, you know, when we see the giant Buddhas being destroyed, right. you know, and, right. and uh, you know, it's just a hole where these beautiful Buddhas were before, right. you know, it's so heartbreaking, but they have 3D um, right. images That's of it. it. You know, can it, can they be remade? And what does that mean to the, the original Buddhas? Does it, is it, do you feel like that's a cop-out or you see that with certain pieces? Um, what's your feeling about all that? Well, it's better than nothing. Uh, yet the, uh, as I told you, the 3D printing even for small places are not that good. But uh, if you do a larger production, you're really losing a lot of details. Right. Really, um, now, I feel it's a, it's a good um, alternative. You cannot mold everything. I mean, the, our storage is huge and that's very costly. And that's also why we, um, you know, that's why we, we try to sell as many pieces as we can because we have to pay uh, rent for our storage to keep all those uh, copies. Now, do you spend a lot of time in the Louvre? We go, I go on the regular base. Well, we have a store over there. That's where you, we buy a lot of souvenir, but also cast. But do you spend time wandering the halls by yourself at night, you know? At night, I don't do that at night. I don't have the authorization. Okay. And uh, I do it at day though, because I, I, I like to see uh, the pieces we have. Sometimes we do replicas and uh, we have to look for details. We don't know our molds might be a little bit old or so it's nice to see the real one also for colors for the patina. Right. Uh, we go there to check the patina uh, hasn't changed because sometimes the patina change with the restorations. Uh, also, we go there to choose. I mean, we do sometimes want to choose a new piece. You know, if there is an exhibition we want to see, and you know, maybe today's eye is different from yesterday's eye, and why we like today might evolve. So, we sometimes do that and 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 choose, you know, pieces that um, nobody had seen before. You say you like to go into the Louvre. You like to look around. We wish we were there with you, and we will be someday soon. And not um, only the Louvre, you know, or say and Versailles, everywhere. Yeah, oh my God, I've never been to Versailles. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm coming. I'm going to come to Paris. Very lucky. Oh, Rodin has great sculpture. Bordel, you know. Okay. When you you know go in and you see so, you see the actual, the original, which mm -hmm. we call the original, and what is that difference between you know seeing something that is in the museum as opposed to the thing that you're creating? Like is do you have a different relationship to it? Is that like the mothership you go there? Yeah. Like, you know? it, it makes the original even more um, mysterious and more, even more wonderful. Sometimes people say that when you replicate a lot of art, a lot of, you know, uh, an art a lot of time, a piece of art a lot of time, it loses value somehow. But in my opinion, it gains value. I see, I see them every day. And when I see the real one, the emotion is there. The stone is a little bit different. Um, I like to see how exact our copies are and see if there are any difference, if we didn't miss anything. Sometimes there are restoration, they've changed it a little bit. Mm. Um, when back then they used to, if there was missing heads or legs, if there was places that were broken, they used to put plaster and reinvent uh, an armor mm. or leg. And now, nowadays they've been taking away every res old restoration. They've been taking away plaster, now, many of our molds have been made on pieces that were, that were restored back then. So there are a difference 
you know, we have arms and legs on some faces and we have, they're really smooth when the original ones sometimes are not. Sometimes we have made the molds on unrestored pieces. I mean, it's really different. So for me, it's very interesting to see all the details, but also sometimes I find plaster, depends the piece. Sometimes I find that the plaster pieces bring more emotion than mm. the stone pieces because they may be dirty or because stone or the material is not as uh, interesting as the, I mean, plaster, when plaster is really, even with no patina, sometimes it's very beautiful. It has a very nice off-white kind of matte and uh, finish, it's good. Can, can you see the intention of the artist more clearly? You know, when you're looking at Michelangelo's work and you're in front of it, do you, do, can you, even though you're making a replica, it's the same size, it's the same idea, but standing in front of the real thing, can you see the, the mind of Michelangelo at work in the, in the sculpture in a different way than you can see it in, in the replica? I see it, and then the, um, the, 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 the craftsmen that, and women that work here see it even more than me. We see the difficulties. We, the eye looks differently. We look for you know, marks of the sizzle, we are uh, very lucky. We have some sculptures that are placed in churches, the back against the wall, sometimes in some kind of niches. And mm -hmm. we can see some Michelangelo's that the views nobody sees. Uh, the Moses, uh, I don't think many curators have ever seen the back. And the back has been sculpt sculpted uh, with uh, great detail. So uh, we're very lucky to see things that even uh, you know, uh, curators or uh, people that work in museums don't see because we have the end, we can go around it. So yeah, and, and, and what is great is to see again, again, the piece. Sometimes when they do a sculpture, a mold, they're going to do it in two pieces. So you have a hand, you have a head, you have a beard. So you have the sculpture in different pieces. And then you get to get in your hand that piece and we get a look with different angles. And, and that's really um, quite, um, something sometimes you know we everybody we take pictures and just because we think it's beautiful and everybody does that here everybody really we all agree we all have our favorites but we often end up with the same favorite i mean you it know, must be kind of amazing because you have three thousand different minds working there you know so that you look at all these pieces and you see these expression of human you know inspiration in front of you it might, must be quite amazing to work there it's amazing. Also, what is amazing is they're from different periods. They're not classified like in the museums. You have African art and you have Oriental art. You have a Buddha, you have right. an Egyptian, you have a Greek. So they're all together. So yeah. it's really some type of, uh, in French West, he's a minister of culture and, and, and a writer called Malraux who wrote a book, uh, Le Musée Imaginaire, the Imaginary Museum. Mm -hmm. and this is kind of an imaginary museum of uh, world uh, sculpture. You really have all the periods from, um, from Stone Age times to almost today. Wow. Can kind you of show us, Sophie, everyone, we're, we're wondering, is there a way for you to walk around? Can we see a little bit of the space? Can you, are you able, or are you on a desktop? I can do it. I don't, I don't want to give you a headache or anything. But well, a little yeah. bit is good. I think we just want to see a little bit. We, we're used to getting seasick. It's okay. Okay. Can, like, if you can, sure. if you can get up and I can show you the workshop. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, just because it's we're really talking about something that is so okay. visual. So here it's just the mo that's what we have uh, the prototypes, right? The models. Yeah. And, uh, the workshop. I don't have the actual workshop. Unfortunately, has no internet. Oh, okay. So we cannot. Sh I cannot show you the workshop. But here you have. Oh wow. Yeah. And here oh, you have bigger pieces. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like here you have the. Uh, and Apollo, Ooh. can you see it? Yeah, that's yeah. one of the first piece that was molded ever, but it yeah, was wow. not molded with for the um, uh, still a, it's a bell a piece that is in the Belvedere in Rome, but we didn't yeah. mold it from uh, the one in Rome, we molded it from a copy in bronze that had been made for a king of France wow. a long time ago. So, yeah. it's a copy of a copy, right? <laughs> Here you have uh, the Nike of Samotras, uh, yeah. you know. And Ooh, Nike, oh, yeah. Nike, Nike, I don't know how you say. It doesn't have his wings. His wings are yeah. on the floor. We don't have the wings together. Yeah. So just for you to see, here we have other pieces. So. Amazing. And trying not to go too fast. Well, you've got one of the greatest jobs in the world. 
it's it's quite uh, amazing and i work with uh, passionate people uh, yeah. great skills yeah and uh, we go everywhere we, we go we do molds that's a piece from babylon yeah uh, it's a Côte d'Amourabi, wow. and it's in the Louvre. I don't know if you see. It has the first yeah. written law. Uh, yeah. Law is written on the surface. And that was the first time he had a, a law written uh, mm -hmm. somewhere. The first and, law? Yeah. Did you say law? The law written? Law. Yeah, yeah law. Sorry. Law. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Wow. Is there anything that you haven't made uh, uh, a, a copy of that you would love to? Is there anything still left to, to do? Your oh, personal? yeah. Yeah, we right. have things we made that, we, that disappeared because the molds were thrown, because they were broken. Well, I'm going to ask for, for I'm going to maybe show you more. Um, there is, um, what are we looking for? There is uh, some great um, Louis XIV sculptures. There is, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Rodin uh, pieces. Uh -huh. There's a lot of pieces I'd like to do um, that are not in the public domain yet. But they're yeah. going to be in the public domain soon. Mm -hmm. Could you ever do a Picasso sculpture or no? No, no, he's in the public domain. Uh -uh. Yeah. yeah. Not yet. Someday. No, someday. But yeah. we have some nice, we have Modigliani, we have some, I'm going to show you more. I can show you, uh, we have internet connection in the Patina workshop. So it's right. not the molding workshop, but it's the Patina workshop. We're How come no one's on. there? Oh, I guess it's late at night. What time is it? It's late. It's, uh, it's uh, 9 p.m. Oh. Okay. But there's still you know, some light because we are the way. It's like a night at the museum, Jesse. I feel like yeah, it's beautiful. they're all going to so, come up so now. And... So that's all type of <laughs> ah. kind of different colors, different materials. You can yeah. get different, you know, uh, bronze Amazing. or or marble mm. or wood. Oh, they're so beautiful. I mean, the colors. So who determines the different color? There. Well, it's the original. We take those are the original? Really? No, that's what determines the color. Those are all the type of effects we can do, right? And yeah. we're going to choose from the original. We try to copy the original. Now, sometimes, sometimes we do funny things for people's, you know, Ikea interior. And sometimes right. we do things like that. Right. You know, um, sometimes we have fun and we do. But that's not classic patina, right? That's just right. color. Yeah, right. Patina is really trying to get the original, uh, the original uh, material, wood, marble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. oh wow. wow. That's plaster, right? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. But it really looks like wood, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that really, that really, that's the person that signed your uh, your foot. I did it. Can you see it? So if you can see, it. it's her material. Yeah. It's all yeah. pigment. She that's really traditional. She mixes it. It's so yeah. traditional. It's no, you know, it's really with a see that's yeah. different. Wow. Oh, so those that's, are that's, what, yeah. uh, that's what we do. Yeah, incredible. So that's, a, that's a little African art. Sophie, this was incredible. Yeah, um, thank you, Sophie, so much. So this is a wonderful was, insight, you know. Yeah. I mean, if so, where do people go to learn more about you? We want to give you a call out. Where, where is there a URL we're going to? Actually, it's a good question you're asking me because our URL is Atelier Moulage uh, de la Réunion des Musées Nationaux. It's difficult. Thank oh. you so much. This was fantastic. Yeah. Yep. We come to Paris, you'll come one day, right? You'll return. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Paris, of course. We love Paris. Thank, thank you so you, much. Sophie. You're welcome, thank you.